can type questions and all that. The Q, there's a Q and A feature, you know. Right. Hey everyone, welcome to Triple V, a show dedicated towards advancing the message of a free society. I'm your Mike, host, Mike Shanklin. Today I'm joined once again by Stefan Kinsella. How are you doing, Kinsella? I'm great. Good to be here, Michael. Yeah, good to have you on the show. Uh, so uh, we wanted to have you on. <laughs> Who would have thought we'd be talking about intellectual property with Stefan Kinsella, right? But obviously it is one of those topics that we have to address. I, I think there's a lot of harm that comes out of it, uh, just like the state, which is why I talk about the state in general. Uh, but I, I wanted to actually go a little bit more and kind of dissect uh, these these discussions, I'm not going to call them arguments that I've seen, but at least discussions over, over this topic. And obviously it is uh, it, it is something that's hard to understand unless you have some kind of a background in property rights and all that. But I, I, for those who already have this kind of grounding, let's go a little bit deeper. So we have uh, you know, designs is, is really what we're talking about when we're talking about IP or a concept, right? So it's all up in the head and mental. But what what I, I'm people are saying that you you can I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that people are accusing you of saying that you can't that you're gonna it sounds like you're gonna stop them from trading yep. things which you're not you're not saying that you're gonna stop people from trading stuff I think there's a difference between saying well what is property and what can be traded so one of the questions that came up is can you trade something that you don't own right well let me ask you a question first of all how long are we gonna? Do we have? Do you have? So I know how much time to budget about, for different issues. About twelve hours. I'm just joking. Go for it. <laughs> we got all time in the day. Okay. Um, so the anti-IP position gets misconstrued a lot. So one way, and uh, this is a brief digression, is uh, you know we'll get accused of being anti-intellectual, right, or anti-creativity, or we're hostile to you know we're materialists or something like that. Um, uh, which is not true at all. Uh, libertarians believe that you only have the fundamental right to not be aggressed against. So we say that the only thing the law can prohibit is the initiation of violence against person or property. And we libertarians get caricatured by mainstream people by saying, well, you don't have any other values then. Well, that's not true. We just think that having the legal system protect the physical integrity of our property is all we need from the legal system to – are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, your your picture is some psychedelic '60s thing now. <laughs> That's my logo. Thanks, though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like it. Thanks, cool. Um, so, but, and of course, we know that's a, that's not a good criticism of libertari of, uh, of libertarianism. Likewise, it's also not a good criticism of liber of uh, anti-IP libertarians that um, that we don't because we don't want to pr have a property right in ideas. Let's say that we're against. Um, Ideas and the importance of ideas. We just don't think we think that protecting property rights in physical things, scarce resources, is sufficient. Uh, but that, of course, the role of the mind is very important. Um, and by the way, half of the liber uh, the IP advocates get angry when you say that what they're in favor of is a property right and ideas. They say, "Well, we don't believe in the property rights and ideas. Um, we just believe in the property rights in the physical instantiation of ideas, or something like that." Um, you know, some kind of bizarre. Uh, copyright or patent doctrine, and then the other half of them get angry at us because they say that we don't believe in protecting ideas. So I never know which IP proponent to argue against because they're all over the map. Now, in the particular question you asked about, this is a, an important question, and I, this is one reason why IP, which has never been my favorite topic, is becoming one of them because to figure this stuff out requires you to reevaluate a lot of fundamental property concepts. And libertarian concepts, uh, it requires you to kind of clarify in your mind a lot of issues. So this gets back to your question about uh, can you trade um, ideas or things like services, things like that. So to to, sol to solve these issues, you have to get back to a question of contract and the question of property. Okay, so I can kind of go into that if you want and, and tell you where I think the mistake is. Where we got off the wrong, off on the wrong track. I think that's right. perfect. I think that's that's attacking the right problem. Go for it. Okay, so so you have until ninety five, let's say, when the digital revolution, the internet revolution, really kicked into high gear. It you didn't really have to become clear on these issues. You could you could have a sloppy formulation of of rights, property rights. You could say like Locke did, for example. 
Now, Locke, Locke is sort of our intellectual forefather, right? And a lot of libertarians retreat to Locke's arguments, which is that you own yourself, whatever that means, because I think the concept of self is kind of vague. I would say we own our bodies. Okay, That's a slight clarification. And just to add that, it's because of double counting or triple counting. Like You can't say that you're, you own your body when you're saying you own your brain. Well, which... I think the, the, the idea that you own your labor, which is the next step, is the double counting. Owning yourself is just vague. It's not clear what's meant. And when gotcha. you use vague terms, it, it, could, it could lead to uh, equivocation, even unintentional equivocation, which means you get someone to agree, well, you own yourself, right? And then later on, then they start talking about souls or something bizarre that you didn't mean – you really meant you, you own your body, which means no one has the right to treat you like a slave and to actually you know, stab your body or even threaten you with force if you don't listen to their orders. So it's really about body ownership. It's okay to call that self-ownership, but you have to keep in mind you're identifying that with your, with your body because yourself is bound up with your body, whatever yourself is. Um, anyway. And then the second step of luck is that we own ourselves, therefore we own what we, our labor because the labor comes from ourselves, and therefore you own unowned resources in the world that you mix your labor with. So that's sort of the Lockean argument. That's okay as far as it goes. I think that modern libertarians have a more precise and rigorous way of describing these things. We have more economic terms now. We're not as flowery. We're, our arguments aren't necessarily bound up with religious arguments like Locke was trying to make. For example, he said we own ourselves because God gave it to us, and this, this commons of things that we can homestead by mixing our labor, we can do that because God gave it to mankind in common. So there's this religious admixture there which, um, uh, which makes the arguments uh, either less precise or depend upon some kind of narrow religious view that not everyone might have that's talking about these things. So my point is the Lockean idea is good, but it's it's not surprising that we can clarify it now, and it especially needs to be clarified in the age of digital technology and the internet. Um, so what I think happened is that um, people have relied upon the common law, okay? The common law as a rough approximation of a private law order. Like libertarians sort of think that the common law is at least presumptively more or less libertarian. So they take for granted these legal concepts and practices that have arisen over the centuries, and they assume that they're like presumptively libertarian. So they say things like, um, if you own your body, you can sell it. This comes into the debate about inalienability, and some people say, well, no, you can't. But the, about other products and other things that we own, they, they'll say, well, if you own something, it means that you can sell it. Okay, which actually doesn't follow, and I can explain why. And they also say the converse. If you, if you sell something, it means that you own it. And th this, So then they'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with a contract um, for me to sell my labor services, for example, like an employment contract. Um, so that must mean that I own my labor, and if you own your labor, then Locke was kind of right, and if you, you can mix your labor with something or you create something, or if you sell an idea. you know. Then that must mean you own the idea. Now, I think these are both fallacies, and there's a fallacy because people haven't clarified their thinking about these things. The right way to look at it, in my view, is let's, let's kind of clear away the clutter, start from the beginning, and think why are we libertarians? What does the basic libertarian principle? What are the basic libertarian principles? And they are very simply that because we live in a world of scarcity, that is, resources that we need to employ as human actors. Including our bodies, but including other things in the world. We need to employ these things to achieve what we want. But because the world is such that there can be conflict over these things, then if we want to live in peace and prosperity and have some kind of way of using these things without conflicting and fighting with each other, then you have to have some kind of rule system that allocates who owns these things. That's what property um, property rights are. And the basic libertarian rule, which is more or less the Lockean or the common law rule. Uh, the basic libertarian rule is when we see a scarce resource in the world that could be disputed, that two or more people have a dispute over or could have a dispute over, including your body, then we solve the question of – we want to say – we want to have a dispute resolution rule. We want to say who gets to use this thing. We want a property rule. The libertarian answer is in the case of your body, the person himself is the owner. Very simple. In other words, we don't believe in slavery. We believe in self-ownership or body ownership. 
In the case of other things, there's two or three simple rules that we apply to determine who owns the thing. Number one, we say who was the first person to appropriate it from the unowned state of nature. Okay, If you can identify that person, they're the owner unless they used a contract to give it to someone else. Okay, So contract, and a third case might be tort or crime. Like uh, if you commit a tort against me, now maybe I have a better claim on your resources than you do because you owe me compensation. But basically it's either an action of the appropriator, the homesteader, or the action of that owner or, or another owner by making a contract or some kind of tort or other action. But it's an action of some person that we can trace to determine who owns this resource. Now, when you own resources, one benefit to owning a resource and what it means to own a resource is it means you have a legally recognized right to be the exclusive person who can use this resource, which really means you can decide if someone else can use it or not. So that means you can deny them permission or you can grant them permission, which is called a license also in the law. So if you own a house, you could give your fr uh, you could invite someone to a dinner party and that would be giving them permission to use your property because you're the owner or you could refuse them per entry or you could kick them out if they act like um, if if they don't act properly. Okay? So you can use this incident or aspect of ownership to come up with contract. So contract is just the exercise of authority over a thing that's owned. It's a consequence of property rights. It's not like an addition to property rights or even the basis of property rights. If you own a resource, if you are the one legally recognized to be able to deny people the right to use it or to grant them permission, then you can grant them permission in different ways. You could grant it gratuitously like inviting someone for a party. You could give it permanently like you could give a gift to someone or you could sell them something. In which case you alienate your ownership of something like when you sell someone an object that you own that you manufactured. You could give it conditionally. You could say, I will give you this, um, this object that I own. You know, this, this, I'll give you this, uh, this chair that I made tomorrow if certain things happen. I could make it conditional you know, if you go to school. If you go to school, if you go to college, I'll pay your tuition for the first semester. I could make a conditional gift. Um, I can also engage in what we call a regular trade, which is the typical thing people think about. So I could say um, 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 I will give you my pig if you give me um, you know, 10 hens. You own some hens. I own a pig. We're going to make a trade. So the condition I'm placing on my alienation of title to my pig is if you give me your, your hens. But that's just one type of alienation or use of ownership. Uh, not every contract is a, is a trade of two owned things like that, and one example would be if I tell you, well, I want my house painted. You have the skill to be a you – know, you have the time. You have the ability. You control your body. You own your body, so you have the ability to not paint my house if you don't want to, so I have to induce you to do it, and I want you to do it. So I say I will give you this gold coin if you paint my house. Now that has a certain resemblance to the earlier trade where we have two items being exchanged for each other, but it's not the same because in this case there's only one title being transferred. That's the money. The money is transferred conditionally upon a certain event occurring, being satisfied, which is you're performing an action that I want to happen. That doesn't mean that you're selling me your labor, although people start using that description because of the similarity of the nature of the transaction. So people start saying… Well, an employment contract or a service contract is similar to an exchange, right? and therefore you, they describe it economically in a sense as selling your labor. Well, then people start thinking, well, if you're selling it, you must own it. right? Now, they're wrong about that actually. You don't own your labor. This is the double counting part. You own your body, but to say that you own your actions that you perform with your body is not only double counting; it's just it's just weird. And well, how? how mean, you know, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Well, how how would you how would you labor or label labor then? I mean, do you give it any kind I of? Think, a I think labor is just an action. I mean, labor is just a type okay. of action. In fact, I think it's almost synonymous with action. So why okay. don't you use the word action? If you use the word action, then you see it's kind of awkward to say that you own your actions. Although some people actually say that, they'll say you own your memories, you own your thoughts, you own your you own your love. You you own your passions. I mean, they they, they use words imprecisely, 
Well, you're said, responsible for the consequences of your actions. I think that's probably the best way to put it, right? <laughs> I think you are responsible for the consequences of your actions, but that is because of the property rights other people have in their scarce resources. Because they have a scare, they have a property right that is a legally recognized exclusive right to control a given scarce resource, which means that other people do not have the right to invade the borders of or 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 uninvitedly, as Hoppe says. Uninvitedly change the physical integrity of someone else's scarce resources, their body or other scarce resources they have a legitimate property right in it. Because they have a property right, there are some actions I am not permitted to perform, and if I do perform them, I have violated their rights. I've committed trespass, and therefore I owe some kind of restitution or there's some kind of consequence to me because of that. But it's not that there's a limit on my property rights. It's that there's a limit on my actions. Okay. But even then, you wouldn't say you own your actions. Now, one, one side point to make here. You, you said that uh, some of the critics of the anti-IP position say that we want to prohibit ownership of ideas or we want to prohibit ownership of non-scarce resources. Th this is actually not correct. We don't want to prohibit anything. Let, let me explain what I think is the proper way to look at it. The libertarian view is simply that there are property rights in scarce resources, in what we call rivalrous resources. In other words, for every resource that there's potentially conflict over, your body and other material resources in the world, the things that can be means of action, things that we can employ to causally affect the world to achieve what we want to achieve. For these kinds of things, we believe there ought to be property rights in them and that they should be assigned according to the simple rules I mentioned earlier. We don't say that there can't – we don't say that there should not be property rights in non-scarce resources. I think the right way to look at it is that it is literally, quite literally, impossible. In fact, it's meaningless to talk about property rights in non-scarce resources. It's not that I want to pass a law prohibiting it. I don't want to pass a law prohibiting 2 plus 2 equal, equaling 5. It's just that 2 plus 2 does not equal 5. right? Um, it is literally impossible to have a property right in a non-scarce resource because property rights are legally recognized exclusive rights of control. You can't control an idea in that sense. You can't exclude people from using it because it's infinitely reproducible. You could have 10 or a million people using the same algorithm or information or knowledge about the world at the same time. It is l literally impossible to control information. Um, what is possible is to control scarce resources. So if you have control of your brain and your body, and you have knowledge that only you have, it's secret or private knowledge, your control of your body gives you the ability to keep that information secret. It doesn't mean you own the information, but once information is public and it, once it spreads, it's a recipe basically, it's literally impossible to own it. And when these IP laws like patent and copyright are enacted, what they really are, they are not really property rights and ideas. What they really are is a property right in other people's scarce resources that are already owned. It's what I call a negative servitude or a negative easement. It's basically a grant by the state to the person that claims this IP right, a patent or a copyright, let's say, that gives them a veto right over how other people use their already owned property, or they can use that to extort money from the person, or they can use that to get physical force from a, from a real court aimed at a person's body or property saying you can't use your body or property in this way. So it always comes down to physical resources, material resources that are scarce resources. So it's really a disguised way of transferring ownership of existing uh, material resources. Um, it's, it's like uh, I was explaining to someone the other day. It's like religion. When people say uh, there are wars fought over religion, this is in a way a sloppy formulation. What they mean is the, the motivation for people to fight is religion, religious disagreement. But the fight is never over religion. It's always over scarce resources. It's right. over people's bodies or people's land or people's money or their cows or their women or whatever. This is what a fight is. It's an actual physical clash of people. Now, I want to kill you because you won't become a Muslim or a Christian or whatever. right? So when people say they fight over religion, 
that's a shorthand for giving an explanation of the motives why people are having a physical clash over physical things. Right? Likewise, when people say that uh, there's a property right in ideas, that's a sloppy and somewhat dishonest way of explaining their rationale for taking a real property right in real things away from me. So what they're saying is because there's something special about your ideas that you generated, um, the law should take some of your existing material property and give it to someone else in terms of this negative easement. So really it's always about physical force being used against real things like your money, your fact, your resources, or your body. Um, so this is the fundamental mistake. The fundamental mistake is when people when people confuse these concepts and they're not clear on them. It's time that we become clear on them, and uh, once once they become clear, the nature of the aggression and the trespass and the taking involved in patenting copyright becomes clear. It becomes clear that it's simply naked aggression. It's a completely unjustified government intervention into the market uh, aimed at basically protecting people from competition. I mean there – if you read what people say in defense of copyright, they'll say… Like I, I posted on Facebook the other day. There's a patent law firm. They're, they're sending a brochure to me because I'm a patent lawyer. Oh, we can help your clients do this, and we'll help them protect their they'll, they'll protect their intellectual property in from being com, uh, for, uh, for, from uh, having competition with you know from their competitors. In other words, the entire purpose of these things is to stop competition. I have people ask me all the time. Well, if I don't have a a patent on my pharmaceutical, how am I going to What's my incentive to, 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 to make drugs? My answer is your incentive is to make a profit by selling a product on the market. And then they'll say, well, what I really mean is how can I make a profit if people can compete with me? I'm like, exactly. <laughs> you don't want people to compete with you, but that's the free market, honey. So yeah, yeah. there we are. Go ahead. You, you, now you no. fire away. So, so basically you, you're basically saying that once – once the uh, the formulation of the concept, the design is out in into the other people's minds, the public domain is what it's usually labeled as. It's it's pretty much a done deal. I mean, there's you can't put the genie back in the box. It's your responsibility if you want to not have this designer concept. But this is this is a little bit of a challenge here for you. Maybe you, you can see right through this. Well, what about the fact that since it is in somebody's head, right? I guess can you say that th that the thought pattern is scarce. Does that make sense? In other words, if I am thinking of something, uh, is, is that a real thing? So, and so let's, yeah, let, let's let's take a simple example. So let's say that you have, um, you want to create a, um, you want to create a, a sword. You think it'd be useful to have a sword. Or maybe you think you can sell the sword because you have skills at that. So you have to obtain the raw materials, right? So like you obtain some iron ore, and you have other things like you have a, a an anvil and a furnace and other equipment. Now you take this iron ore, which you have to up obtain title to somehow. You have to obtain ownership somehow. You either go take it out of the ground if it's unowned, or you purchase it from a previous owner, right? Right. So. You own, so th this is one mistake a lot of people make is they say that, well, creation, if you produce something, then you're the owner of that. Well, producing implies rearranging existing raw materials into some other configuration, and if you didn't already own the raw materials, then how, how did you have the right to use them in your process? So if you're just rearranging them, you own the resulting product because you already owned the things you're rearranging, not because of your production. Your production transformed them and made them more valuable. So let's let's take but that's a tangent. Getting back to your question, let's imagine I have this raw iron ore. It's in one pattern, right? And now I rearrange it by heating it and hammering it and forging it into a sword. Now it's got a new pattern. Now, would you say the pattern is a scarce resource? I don't think so. It's just a description of the arrangement of the material that was owned. So no, I don't think that and, and that's analogous to the pattern of ideas in your brain. You own your brain, you own your body. Uh, how your brain is arranged is not ownable. It's not a scarce resource. Okay. Okay. No, it's that, knowledge, that does information. Clarify. In fact, if you think about praxeology, what Mises taught, 
Mises talks, he doesn't go into a lot of detail about this aspect of it, but it's pretty clear. Human action is a very simple thing. It's a human controlling his body and exercising his will and his choices to try to achieve something in the future, right? to try to change the outcome of what would be. To, to think and act. Some, say again? To think and act, yeah. So to change something, to change the outcome of events, you have to employ physical causal means. That means you have to use something that's causally efficacious, that actually works. You know, If I want to get rid of a tree stump on my lawn, I might choose dynamite because it actually explodes and causally gets rid of the tree stump. right? If I use – I don't know. If I use uh, wet paper, <laughs> it's not going to do it. It's not a causally efficacious means. Bad example, but still. Um, uh, so the point is there's a distinction. There's two important elements to human action. One is the availability of the, – the ability to control necessarily uh, – uh, uh, necessary means that can help you achieve it. That's what property rights are for. You need property rights in your body. And in these scarce means because they're scarce. You need to use them because you, you have to have scarce means to get something done. We want property rights so that we don't have conflict over these things. But you also need knowledge or what you could call in general recipes or information about the world to guide your action. So these things are, are complementary aspects of action, but one of them is a scarce means. One is knowledge. The scarce means are subject to property rights. The knowledge is not. The knowledge is useful and, in fact, is crucial, and if you think about it, the knowledge is useful for two things. It's useful to, number one, to decide on what possible ends in the future are possible. You have to have some idea of the ends possible, and you have to have some knowledge of causal laws, scientific knowledge, so that you can choose the means to achieve it. So the knowledge is sort of twofold, and, this, and the first type of knowledge involves knowing yourself and knowing the world. So for example, if you're hungry and you have a desire to be satisfied and you have a sweet tooth, let's say, you might know from experience that, that sugary products like a cake might do the trick. right? That's knowledge that you have. You've acquired by experience and self-knowledge. But if you've only ever tasted a vanilla and a chocolate cake, it might never occur to you that a cherry cake or a apple strudel or, or, or a coconut cake might also satisfy you. You might never have thought of these things. right? So if so, the knowledge you have about yourself and about what's possible informs the universe of ends that you can visualize. It might only be a small number of options that you even think are possible, but if you've had a wider experience or you're smarter, maybe you think of six, six or ten or a larger number of ends that you can go for, and then you choose among those wider number of ends, and there's more likely that you can now choose one that satisfies you even more, so your profit, in effect, potentially grows. And then you have knowledge about how do you employ means in the world to achieve whichever end you've chosen, and they go back they go back and forth with each other too. You kind of cons you consult each one informs the other, right? Your knowledge of what means are possible informs what ends you might go for in the first place, and your knowledge of ends is informed by your knowledge of means. They they, they go together, but they're somewhat distinct. So your knowledge of means, you know, you might know I can I can bake a cake, I can hire someone to bake a cake for me. I can purchase it from the baker down the street, or maybe you think you can pray, and the cake will be conjured up by some magic spell. Now, that's false information because it actually won't achieve your ends, but it's still knowledge that guides the actions that you perform. So we have to think of information, patterns, recipes as useful as, a, as an in crucial ingredient to action, but I don't think they're properly considered uh, scarce uh, resources. All right, hold on. I got I got a question from somebody in the uh, in the viewership area. They they want me to ask. We don't own things; we use them, right? And I I want to say that own ownership is just saying who can control what at what time, right? Yeah. So ownership. I think the best way to think of ownership is it's a a legally recognized. Now, I, when I say legal, I don't mean we have to have a state system. I just mean <laughs> Whatever sort of uh, legal or law rules are widely respected in a given area. As it can mentioned. happen in poly. It can happen in polycentric law, right? Yeah. Absolutely. 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 It was. It has happened. It does happen in polycentric right. law. Um, so ownership simply means that there's a widely legally recognized right 
to control a resource. So human action is the use of resources. That's correct. Um, but if you don't have legal rights, for example, Crusoe on an island by himself, someone not in society has no property rights. He only has uh, human action. He only employs scarce resources, but he has no socially recognized legal or exclusive right to control the resource because there's no one else to respect his rights. In society, because there's a possibility of m multiple human actors desiring to use the same resource at the same time in the same way in a way that excludes other people, because of this possibility, then there's a possibility of conflict. And if there's conflict, then people spend their times physically fighting or being violent, and you're, a you're not able to use the resource uh, as efficiently, let's say, at the least, right? or maybe you can't use it at all because it's taken from you. So life is totally different. Because of the various advantages of social cooperation, because we're a social species, most human beings tend to have some empathy for their fellow man. They value themselves, but they also value their fellow, value their fellow man, and they value the… The social order. They value the ability of cooperation. Most people are basically decent in the sense that they disvalue interpersonal violence. Doesn't mean they never engage in it, but at least they have second thoughts about it. Or at least they think if I'm going to engage in violence with someone, I'm a little reluctant to do that. I feel some qualms about it. So I want a justification for it. So they seek. To justify their actions, not everyone, but enough people to generate legal norms and rights norms. No, absolutely. All right. So I guess one of the things that is is confusing. To, I think we summarized this. Basically, you own the electrons that go from your from the computer to your internet provider and all around the world. Well, at least you, you might. You know, you have a contract for that in essence, and those are real scarce items, right? I mean, the, the electrons really are real things out there with atoms. Uh, and then you have um, – that's real property. It's just like the paper and the ink that the design might come on, right? Uh, but, the, but the actual concept or the design itself can basically – it can never it can never be – see, that's my question though. Why, why would you say that it's – yeah, it, it makes sense now to me too. Okay. Well, well, I, I think I know. <laughs> let, let me let me mention this. I think I know okay. kind of where you're going with it. It's, it gets back to this question of why am I prohibiting people from owning non-scarce things? It's not a prohib prohibition. It's simply that the real nature of these ownership rights. See, ownership always has to be enforced against real things, against material things, scarce things, with physical force. So the question really is, who gets to control this money? Like, who gets to control the money in your in your bank account, right? Should it be you or should it be someone else? It should be you unless someone has a good reason for taking it. One good reason might be that you gave it to them by contract. Another might be that you committed a tort. Another might be that you stole the money from them. Okay, But other than those kinds of things, you own that money, and these rules always – it's so an analogy – I give you two analogies. One would be inflation. I mean if you don't really understand the nature of money, you might say, well… You might start associating money with wealth, just like people falsely associate the ability to sell something in a contract with ownership of the thing that's sold. That's not actually true. So people associate money with wealth, so they, they might think, well, why doesn't the government just print more money, make everyone rich? Why doesn't the government <laughs> right. just have a high minimum wage, make everyone rich? But we understand that if the government prints more money, it inflates money. And that dilutes the value of existing money or reduces the purchasing power of existing money. Right? That's called price inflation. We understand that. You can't print money for free. I mean, when I say free, there's not, it's not that there's no cost to it. There is a cost. It's just the cost is borne by the population in general. If the government prints a, a trillion dollars this year, they can spend a trillion dollars, but that means that the purchasing power of everyone else is reduced by a trillion on average. That's why there's price inflation, right? Absolutely. A similar phenomenon exists in the field of what's called positive or welfare rights. So your typical liberal will say, you know, well, we're not opposed to property rights. We just want more than that. So we believe, yeah, there should be property rights in your car and in your bank account, in your house, in your body. They call that personal property instead of just private property, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know what they call it, but but they'll say we just want to add more rights to that. Let's have the government add more. 
So in addition to these regular rights, you know, that's what the four, the four, what is it called, the four freedoms of, of, of Wilson or whatever, right? For freedom from want, freedom from fear, or whatever. We're going to say, well, there should also be a, there should be a right to your body, but there should also be a right to education, and there should also be a right to um, health care, and there should also be a right to a job. All these kinds of things, right? Uh, and a right to a minimum income, even, right? So we're just adding rights. Who can complain about more rights? Well, the problem is these are positive rights, and they come at a cost because every right has a correlative obligation. Now, your your negative, so-called negative right to be free of murder, that is free of someone stabbing a knife into your body, <laughs> only gives other people a negative obligation. That is an obligation to refrain from a given action, to refrain from crossing the borders of your property without your permission. And we can all live with that. We can all live with a live, live and let live set of rules. That's what the libertarian non-aggression principle is about. But as soon as you have a positive right, that has a correlative positive obligation. So if you have a right to a minimum income, that means that other people have a positive obligation to provide you with that income, which means basically they're your partial slaves, that you own part of their bodies or their, or their labor or whatever. right? Um, that's the problem with it. These things don't come for free, and it's it's the same thing with uh, granting property rights in non-scarce resources. They always have to be enforced with physical force against physical things. So it always chips away at and comes at the expense of. It takes one way to imagine this is imagine that uh, we had had patent and copyright since the beginning of human human history. And that the terms were not finite like they are now, that they were perpetual, like some IP advocates uh, advocate actually, like Galambos and some others, even some Randians. Okay? Now, that means that we would be living in a world by now where everything that's ever been thought of, every useful – the idea of lighting a fire, the idea of building a home instead of living in a cave, the idea of using clothing, right? the idea of cooking food instead of eating it raw… All these things would be owned by someone, and for you to engage in almost any action that you can conceive of to survive or to live in the world would be trampling on literally thousands or millions or billions of other people's idea rights, property rights. You'd have to get permission of everyone all the time. Your entire life would be a series of seeking permission from people, paying licensing fees and royalties and trading… Basically, life would be snuffed out. In other words, the point is if you have – if you seriously have a real IP system, it increasingly strangles and comes at the expense of property rights in the real world, and would ki we would die as a species. We would, we would literally be snuffed out. Yeah, it's like I, an economic sanction. <laughs> it is. It's like an extreme economic sanction that's so extreme that we would just die. Which is yeah. why these people make exceptions for it because they don't want to push their idea. It's just like the people that advocate minimum wage, right? They they, they want a seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve dollar minimum wage, and you say, well, why not a hundred? They go, oh, right. man, that's that's extreme, that's crazy, because they sort of know that that would that would that would cause the economy to collapse and everyone would die, you know. So they don't advocate that. They just want to chip away at it a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. that's still bad. It's still bad to reduce people's income and to reduce their liberty. Even All right, it's so, only partial. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, YouTube user Bonded Liberty wants me to ask, uh, who grants these rights, like for property rights? Or are they just there because we're individuals in your mind? That sounds like an anarchist question. I mean maybe you can weigh in on what you think on this one. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I mean I, in today's world, they're granted by the state. Well, I, th I think argumentation ethics plays into this obviously, right? Well, that's my that's my perspective. Not every libertarian shares that, but um, in, in in today's society, the state has monopolized the legal function and even the idea of government. Like I'm always trying to I'm, lately, I'm careful to try to distinguish government from state, because right. if you say you're an anarchist, they say, well, you're against government, and they equate government with law and order and with uh, a legal system and this kind of stuff. But to my mind. Just just as the government has taken over the function of education largely and roads, and so now people identify roads as being a government function, it's not really uh, – sorry, I should say a state function. Government is also not a state function. It's just something the state has taken over. 
But without the state, you would have roads, you would have education, and you would have government in the sense of institutions of law and order. Um, and that is where these rights would be, quote, granted by. Now they're granted by government edict or fiat, by state fiat or edict, gov state a state-type government, I should say. In a private society, uh, assuming a sufficiently justice-oriented population, and to my mind that really means you have to have two things to have a just legal order. You have to have people that are basically decent. They have… Civilized values. They generally want to cooperate with people. They generally have some empathy for their fellow man, and you have to have economic literacy. If you don't have economic literacy, then you might believe that some kind of statism or totalitarianism or communism is the best way to go or is the only way to go or something like that. But if you have some economic literacy, then you start realizing that the way to achieve our goals of peace and prosperity and harmony um, and social cooperation… Is a free market, which is respect for private property rights. So I'd and, say and that I wouldn't say they're granted on the free market. I would say that they're socially recognized by the bulk of your fellow men because it comports with their values and with their understanding of economics. And and I think you can't really respect others if you don't allow, you know, if, if people can't control the resources around them, just look, look at Cuba, right? <laughs> you know, I think it's a, if a perfect example of that uh, that. Like you have the claim of somebody else. If we're going to all be our own kings in our own way and and be truly equal, where none of us are going to have an ethical advantage over other somebody else, we don't we can't use forced hierarchy on them. Uh, that means no uh, no Nietzsche people can just monopolize the resources either. So we'd have to voluntarily trade for them. I mean, it just comes back down to the logic of since we are individuals and we want to get along with each other and we are free autonomous individuals, we have to respect uh, everybody else. In their own autonomy, so um, that, that's yeah. the way I look at it. All right, I'm, so, seeing, the, I'm seeing the comments now that you're seeing now. So uh, I see what I see where you're getting this from. Anyway, I'm mm -hmm. getting the hang of this technology, this fancy technology. <laughs> yeah, technology, that's right. So, what, so, what, so what do you think about? What's your opinion on on the? Uh, um, you mentioned argumentation. I think give give me. I'm curious what your take is on. Yeah, on I mean, that I, approach I, to justifying rights. Well, I definitely agree with it because it's basically saying if you argue against the, your individual choice, then you're being hypocritical in nature, right? I mean, you, you can't you can't say, uh, well, what we should do is is centralize all of these resources and and not allow other people or give them the false facade that a vote's going to help or or something like this, or that you don't even need to vote because it's all going to come back down to horizontal democracy. Okay, I think people think that there's this like perfect place. Where somehow you're going to be able to, uh, everybody's just going to have this kumbaya moment. We're all going to just give all the poor people stuff from from and and no property rights, and everybody can just. But the thing is, we we have disagreements. Even if you use the scientific method, scientists today still have disagreements on uh, the end results of a scientific method. So, uh, not not that saying that. I mean, look at look at uh, metaphysics or physics in general too. Once you think you understand something, it flips upside down on you, right? And so, uh, in essence, since we are individuals, like argumentation ethics basically states, for me to open my mouth and to argue uh, that I have the, – the, that we should be communicating but that I should use violence… Yeah, it's, it's obviously you're just like, it's, it's, well, what's well, it going to be? Are you going to be? Are you going to have a discussion with me and, and treat me with respect yeah. and allow me to do it as I wish, yeah. or you can use violence on me? Those yeah. are the only two options. Yeah, and, and if you if 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 they, if they admit the first, then they can't deny that there's something unique about each of. I mean, it, it seems to me that if you, it's basically uh, if you approach someone with the well, we first have to argumentation ethics recognizes that the, there's a distinction between. The way we establish scientific knowledge about causal laws, right? the scientific method, etc., that's a descriptive view of the universe and the world around us. But when we're talking about norms and values and oughts and shoulds and morals, we're kind of having a conversation about what we all think should be done. right? So that implies that you – if you make a proposition to you, you're trying to justify it. I'm saying, listen, here's what I think the rule should be. About how we should get along in society, then you're implying that you have a reason for it. You don't. You can't just say it's arbitrary. You have to have a reason for the rule, some reason. 
And so if I propose, well, I think the rule should be that that uh, everyone should leave me alone, but I get to I get to hit you over the head when I feel <laughs> like it. Well, th that is that's like an arbitrary assertion because if I say that people should leave me alone, presumably there's some reason for that. Even if I don't know what it is, there's some reason for it, and the only thing it could be is that it's something to do with my nature. My nature as what? As a fellow human being, which a characteristic which you also share. So if I'm saying that I have the right to be left alone, then I, it's I can't I can't deny that you have a similar right because we have a similar nature. Unless I can point to some difference between us other than the mere fact that you're not me, right? It has can't just be that you're not me. I'm me and you're you, and therefore I'm I should own the universe. That's not a real <laughs> conversation. Has no chance of ever persuading anyone. It does now, with George Bush and Obama, that's for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, they use, that's yeah. why they have to use force. Now, yeah. if I tell you the reason I get to use force against you and you can't use it against me is because yesterday you broke into my house and you killed my children and stole my sheep. So you've actually committed an action that distinguishes you from the rest of humanity. Right? It, it marks you as different. You have done something objective in the world that does justify me treating you differently than you're entitled to treat me. Now that would be, in my mind, the reason why it is permissible to use at least defensive force, if not force for restitution or even for retribution. Um, so when people say Hoppe's argument, agitation ethics, doesn't make sense because it's possible for a master to argue with his slave, I don't think that's a le legitimate criticism for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, if if in the case of let's say uh, antebellum American chattel slavery, the owner is granting his slave temporarily the right to argue. The owner is actually contradicting himself by maintaining ownership of the slave. He's actually – this actually demonstrates the power of argumentation ethics. Amen. Eric, I mean he, he, sh he should free his slave. I mean he's, he's wrong to do that. But on the other hand, if I caught you attacking my family and you know, you're, you're, I'm using self-defense against you to subdue you, my argument, my justification is not arbitrary. It is grounded in the nature of things. It's not just a particular what we call a particularistic argument. It's not that um, I'm I'm not I'm not simply saying I can use force against you because you're you and I'm me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying no, I can use force against you because you invaded my property. You committed an action that violated my property rights, and therefore I'm entitled to do something similar back to you. In fact, you have no right to complain about it because you've already endorsed this normative rule. In your actions, you can tell. You know where I think it really comes from. I think people are afraid that like somebody's going to take over the world through capitalism. Like that's even possible, right? Uh, I, I think that's really the, the fear that some guy is going to get like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all resources and then take that last hundred percent. It will never have good humanity again, or some nonsense like that. I it's think just, that's part of it. Uh, yeah, I, I think. think it's, I, yeah. I think. I think they. Uh, th that comes from again economic ignorance because it's. People ignore the fact that it actually costs – it's costly to to maintain your property. Um, you know, If I wanted to homestead a patch of land for a farm, I don't want to make it too big because the bigger I make it, the more resources it takes to, uh, to, to patrol it and to keep it up. And if it, let's say I tried to homestead. I built a fence around a, a, a thousand square miles in a virgin continent. I mean, if I've just got a little farm in one corner of it, that's really all I'm going to be doing day to day. And over time, there might be people wandering into the other corners of it, and they might be homesteading, living what they call squatters, right? And over time, they acquire by what we call acquisitive prescription or statute of limitations nowadays, they acquire a right to, to use it. And I think it's perfectly proper because I'm not, I basically demonstrated. By my lack of patrolling the land and my lack of taking action to kick the squatters off, I've demonstrated acquiescence in what they're doing. I've effectively abandoned that land to them. So there's a limit to how much uh, property you can control, and on the other hand, the more property you really can afford to control, it's only because you're extremely productive and you're generating resources with the land, the, the property you're using that uh, permits you to monitor and control uh, the resources you have. 
that's a good thing. That's a that's something we want to encourage. That's a productive use of research, which it's kind of like everyone saying, in the world. Yeah, it's kind of like demonizing monopolies. I, I demonize violent monopolies, but if there's a free market monopoly, technically, I guess it's not always a monopoly because you always have all these alternative uh, substitutes and anybody can compete. But in theory, let's say some company is a monopoly in a free market. Somehow they have this like one thing that they're producing. It's because they are absolutely amazing at making this thing and no other company can do it nearly as efficient as them, right? Yeah. Look, I got – this is my computer on the YouTube, which is about 60 seconds delayed. That's kind of cool. Sorry. Don't want to mess with your mind here. <laughs> All right. Back to reality. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you're watching that. I just well, I turned yeah, off I've the got YouTube them both link. open now. I'm just I'm oh yeah, you know you can click on the uh, click on the little view all comments on the upper right hand corner and you can just see comments and they come in. There's a lot of people watching. Say again. Just not say again. What'd you say? On the Where's upper right hand corner of the YouTube channel, on the upper right hand corner of the YouTube video, okay. you'll see where it says view all comments, and you can click that. There's not there's a lot of people watching, but there's not a lot of people commenting right now. But anyway, um, um, yeah, let's move on. I want to go to John Myers wants me to ask you. Or he first states, I always like hearing him in debate whether a corporation can exist in a free market or is it a simply a state-granted privilege. <laughs> his, his main question is, is limit, can limited liability for corporations exist in a free market? And I, I'd like to say this real quick. When I think of if incorporation, the first thing, because that was really started up by a state, right? I mean, like, well, I guess we didn't have property rights to have free market businesses like that really back before uh, the state tried to incorporate things. This goes back to Roman times, but really started hitting heavy, I think, over in the, the Europe in 14, 1300s, 1400s is what okay. I've seen through my history. Okay. But my thing is, I don't like – I think it's, it is a government – legal term. I like to differentiate which, which one? Which one? Limited liability Cor or corporations? No, corporations. I like to say that corporations uh, are, are state licensed businesses and that non-state licensed businesses are just, I just call them free market businesses. And when I break that down to somebody, like I, I've been on uh, Partisan Exchange, that group, that Facebook group, and I've been talking to people. And I, I once told this lady, she's like, "You just want corporations and plutocracy and blah blah blah." And I, I and so I, I said, "You are the one who's actually enabling plutocracy through the state, right?" Well, kind of going back to the fact of trying to take over the world uh, through the free market. That's why they entered the state in the first place, is because you got to use the guns of government to really take over the world, right? Uh, but the, 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 to me, corporations themselves are like you could have. I, I think they're different than free market businesses. This, this all comes back down, though, to the definition of a corporation. I also think you will have some limited liability written into contracts, but I, I'm also weary because I don't want to create an incentive where people just donate to any business that they don't even go, like, I'll just donate to the mafia. You know, Maybe they'll make me a profit today. Uh, but they have to have some okay, responsibility so as to their actions, right? Yeah, so – okay, so we're – Changing years now, which is fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, okay. Let me say a couple things. Number one, um, I I just had a pretty explicit uh, lecture on this at the Hoppe's Property and Freedom Society uh, in October, and it's not online yet. I'm waiting for the YouTube. It's coming soon, so the, I'll, I'll post that soon. And you and I actually discussed this issue before, and I, I can and yeah. I discussed it with Stephen Molyneux too, and I've written on this issue. Um, first of all, I don't. I don't think in a free society there's any limitation on what you can call yourself. So let's let's talk about that. It's like the gay marriage issue. I mean, you're you're entitled to use whatever words you want to describe your relationship or your arrangement. If other people don't accept it, they don't use it. You know, if if I am a man and I call myself Chelsea and Mrs., some people might adopt that usage, some people might not. If I'm if, if two gay guys get married or they have a ceremony, which they call a wedding, and they call themselves married and husband and husband, some, some religious people may refuse to go along with that. This is just the interaction of free people. Words are what – people can use whatever words they want. Corp means body in Latin, corpus, right? So corporation means a body. That word is used primarily because the state co-opted the mechanism. And they adopted what's called the entity theory. So they say that a corporation has a legal status. It's a legal person. It has an entity. And the state says that um, that this grant of legal personhood is necessary for the corporation to exist, and therefore we, the state, can condition that privilege, that grant, and we can tax the corporation. We can regulate it. We can make it a good corporate citizen, etc. 
I think this is a lie. The state – a company doesn't need the state's help to become a corporation or to use the word corporation or to achieve limited liability status more or less. Not exactly like the state grants it, but more or less. So in a free society, I do believe you could have corp uh, you could have firms, let's just say firms or businesses, and they would basically be what we call limited liability partnerships or something like that. They could have contracts with their vendors, which by which they say, or, and their and their and their creditors, and their customers, and they make it clear when you deal with us, if there's a dispute, if there's a lawsuit, if there's damages that we owe you. They're going to be limited to certain defined corporate assets, but not the personal assets of the so-called shareholders of this venture. I think that's – if that's done by contract, it's perfectly legitimate. In fact, almost no one argues against that because it's by contract. The question of tort liability – and by the way, I go into this in more detail in my um, talk, which I'll, I'll try to post soon. The question of tort liability is, is more difficult because… That there's no contract with the tort victim. There's just someone run over by a FedEx truck, right? He never agreed to only pursue the assets of the <laughs> truck driver. But the question we have to ask is, um, why should anyone else be liable for the for the negligence of a given person? That's that's what we call vicarious responsibility or liability. And unless you have a good reason, the person who commits an action is the one responsible for it. So if you're run over by a guy driving a truck, then he is responsible for that, and only him unless you can show someone else should be liable. Now, I think you could make an argument that his, his boss may be liable in some cases. In some cases, not in all. I mean what if, what if this guy… Drives a FedEx truck, and he's running his errands, and he decides to go stop at a bar. He gets drunk. He goes on a three-day bender, drives across Arizona, and he runs over a couple of people. I mean, okay, so is that FedEx's responsibility? The only reason you could say it is is because they supplied him with the truck. Well, but they didn't supply him with the truck to go kill people. Right. What if you loan your brother-in-law your car to go drive to Walmart, and he hits someone while he's driving your car? Does that mean you should be liable? So you're saying it's intent based? I think it should be intention based, and um, and this is what uh, Patrick Tinsley, a good friend of mine, and I argue in our article causation and uh, aggression, where you have to develop a theory of causation rooted in these easy and praxeology terms. And I don't think that this is basically a simple minded people people just have this simple minded strict liability theory. They assume that. If you own property, you're responsible for it. Well, actually, I think you're responsible for your actions, not your property. Now, l let's say someone breaks in your house and steals your gun, and they kill someone with it. Does that mean you're a, you're a co-conspirator with them, that you've committed murder? I don't think so. Or what if I sell you a gun? Unless I know you're going to commit murder with it, why am I liable for what you do with property that I loan you or give you or sell you or that you steal from me? So I don't think that responsibility attaches to ownership of property. Ownership is the right to use and the right to exclude. It's not a responsibility issue. It's the right to use and exclude. You're responsible for your actions, not your property. That, that's how I look at it. No, good stuff. All right. So, All right. so I think actually you would have something in a free market very similar to corporations of today. Whether they would be called corporations, I don't know. I don't know what you'd call them. I don't care what you call them. Yeah. Um, but I do think that limited liability is the default presupposition because people are responsible for their own actions, and if you want to show someone else is liable, you have to have a good argument. And shareholders have not caused the employee to become negligent. Agreed. They, they simply vote for directors, and they have a right to get dividends, and some of them may have given some money to the corporation, but so do customers. Are customers all liable for every – I mean every McDonald's customer, are they supposed to be liable now for every tort every McDonald's employee commits? Right. It's ridiculous. No, good point. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you obviously on that. Um, I have some questions from the thing. I also want to talk about uh, why you identify as anarcho-libertarian, but we'll get to that after this question. Uh, somebody says… 
Hey, hey, Stefan, this is Harrison. Last night a person called into the Molyneux show and mentioned you. Our argument was on the word ownership. Ownership implies exclusive use of and uh, exclu exclusive use of. And Molyneux was saying we own the effects of our actions. This is moral responsibility as you were discussing. Yeah. But it is not really owning the action. I agree. Order. I agree. I, yeah, I, I, th I agree. I, I think, I think, I think that summarizes it. I think Mo I, I, yeah, I've heard Stefan use these terms many times. I don't think – I mean Stefan and I agree on almost everything, I think. Right. Uh, it's just I'm more legalistic-minded, and my style is maybe a little different. Um, when he says you own the results of your actions, I, I think what he means is you should be responsible yeah. for, for what you do. Um, I wouldn't say – I wouldn't use the word ownership for that because I think it's potentially uh, misleading and confusing. So, you know um, But I understand why he uses it. You know what I always say is if you get to the point where you're arguing whether ownership is a good enough term for us libertarians to use, you've already gotten to a free society. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. This, is, this is not a problem. I mean not a big right. problem. This is a right. good thing. Yeah, but, um, exactly. Yeah, when more people are talking about that question, they already get the rest of it, right? Well, actually, uh, in my podcast number 25, you and I talked, and we talked about this limited liability issue. In the very right. next podcast, I'm looking on my page. Number twenty six. I talked with Stephen Molyneux about this whole issue. Right. Um, he, I don't know if he's being polite or, but I thought we more or less agreed because he, before that, he had sort of had doubts about corporations' limited liability, and I recently heard him on another show where he's expressed doubts. So I don't know if we're quite eye to eye on this issue. I think if you cut through the the semantical confusion, maybe, and the and the, the, the different terminology. Right. We're basically on the same term. Oh, none of us agree that the government should be granting state and – I would agree with, with you and, or with, with whoever, with Stefan. I think the government – well, the government shouldn't exist. The state shouldn't exist, right. and they, they should get out of the business of incorporating uh, – chartering corporations. I just right. have a different prediction about what would happen. I don't think that in a free society you would find shareholders or the investors of corp companies – Personally liable for every tort committed by every employee of that corporation or that firm just because they gave money to it. And, and not right. only that, I think that the the very concept of employee is a state concept. The state has these categories because by classifying what an employee is, now they can regulate you. They can say if someone's an employee, you have to withhold taxes for them. You have to give them certain union organizing rights, all these kinds of things. This is completely a state uh, – this is done by the state for the state's interest, just like property rights, by the way. This, the, the original um, – not property rights themselves, but um, you ever heard of the Domesday Book? Like this is back in England in the I don't know, no. or something. But this is like uh, the government went around trying to put stones, markers down to figure out who owned which land and have a – a book showing who owned what. Now we think that that's a good thing. We need property title records. We need deeds. Well, why do you think the government did that? Well, to control so that they for, for property taxes. They want right to property taxes. Right. Who they could collect taxes from? So you've got to be really wary of all these government um, attempts to control things. Now you had another question about. Why I call myself anarcho libertarian? Yeah, this is actually kind of the last question for today too. Okay. Um, we've already been here over an hour, but this is a great conversation. I love it. Uh, Blake Williams says maybe ask him to talk about his view on why libertarianism is neither left nor right, and perhaps a discussion on left libertarianism, mutualism, anarcho communism, stuff like that. Now we've we've kind of had this conversation before too. We've talked a lot mm -hmm. about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but why is it? Like some people automatically label us as rightists and then just try to label us with Republicans. And I think there's, you know, there's obviously two different worlds that we're talking about here, uh, because when when there's the the property right view of left right, which is the left means no property rights in theory, you know, historically, and the right usually means that we do believe in property rights. And then on the other side of this, you have left right, which just means liberal conservative, which is all muddled and fuzzy and it makes no sense whatsoever. So that's that's the way I view it. But you like to use the word anarcho libertarian and I, I think it basically shows I've always argued that you have to have voluntarism at its at its base before you can even have voluntary collectivism, right? You have to respect the individual. So I, I've always argued that that you can have an anarcho commune inside of anarcho capitalism, but you can't have anarcho capitalism inside of anarcho communism, right? Well I agree with that. Um, and I don't I don't 
claim strongly that libertarianism or anarcho is the best term to use. I'm, I mean, you know, socialist might have been the best term if, if it hadn't been corrupted by the socialists. Liberal might have been the best term to use. I'm not opposed to voluntarist. I think that's a good term. Um, my understanding is voluntarist is more or less synonymous with what I mean by anarcho libertarian. I think the term libertarian is okay. Um, I mean, I think the term libertarian is okay, but there are different types of libertarians. Unless you want to say that anyone who believes in the state at all, like any minarchist even, is not a libertarian. And I do think that they're, they're not consistent, and they, they do uh, they do compromise their principles by being in favor of the state, even, even an ultra minarchist. But I'm not willing to read them out of the movement. I mean, I think they're basically libertarian. They just are confused on the nature of the state. Um, so I think we need to distinguish types of libertarians. We have anarcho-libertarians. We have minarchists. You could even include maybe some classical liberals as on the fringes of what we believe in. Um, Gerard Casey has a brand new book that's great. It's called Libertarian Anarchism. So he does it the other way around. He talks about anarchism and what flavor of anarchist are you? And he says we're libertarian anarchists because we believe in private property rights, or etc. I, I, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Um, on the left-right issue, um, I, I, I tire of these debates about whether we're really of the right or of the left. I think that a lot of modern libertarians, at least until the last, say, generation, came in from sort of, in America at least, from right-oriented um, uh, groups like Chamber of Commerce type groups, Leonard Reed, Foundation for Economic Education. The early Republicans, sort of pro-business kind of guys, you know, pro-market. I mean, the Republicans yeah, Barry are now. Barry Goldwater, that Barry Goldwater. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, the the Re Republicans are now in the U.S. Uh, the religious right, which are not libertarian, the neocons, which are just pro-war, control freaks, and the free market types, which are like a subset of libertarian. They they believe in a. They're kind of soft libertarians or partial libertarians. Um. But there's there are libertarian strands of left thought too, so you can see why some people come into it from that direction too. But just because people historically or chronologically, um, or in their personal history, I mean, everyone comes into libertarianism from, from their personal history. There are certain influences; they vary. Some are left, some are right, some are different. Um, some are atheists, some are religious. I don't know, you know, whatever. Um, I don't think that. The way people come into it should characterize the movement itself, and I am a strong believer. I've always been a strong believer like this just basically Nolan chart idea, the Nolan chart idea that the left-right spectrum is 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 basically a, a cons – I won't say conspiracy, but it's – it's it's it, accepting the left-right spectrum is buying into the statist idea in the first place. I mean first of all, we libertarians don't believe left and right are all that different. Right? What's the difference between Hitler and um, – Political left and right, right. Yeah, I mean they're, they're both socialists of various stripes, which is what I like about Hoppe, Hoppe's book, Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. He characterizes different flavors of socialism, socialism Russian style, the socialism of conservatism, you know, um, welfare state socialism, etc. There are all types of socialism, which is the idea that there's a collective kind of ownership of private property. There's different arguments for it. There's different flavors of it: fascism, totalitarianism, communism, theocracy, uh, welfareism, etc. But left and right doesn't make a big difference to us, and they're both flawed. So this argument about whether we're from the right or from the left, I think, is a is a stupid, flawed argument. We're not from either. We're actually, look, I'm proud to be a libertarian. I'm very proud to be a libertarian, and I think we are. Far superior. I'm not saying there's nothing to learn from other people. There's something you can learn from left writers. You got to be aware that they're economically illiterate usually. There's something to learn from conservatives, but you have to be aware that they have other problems too. I'm not saying we can't learn from people, but we are far superior to these people. They're both our enemies in a sense. They're the enemies of society and humankind. Well, it's either, aggression, it's either aggression or it's non aggression. I mean, those are the only I two agree. options. And this so, is the thing when like anarcho capitalism the term is really redundant because to me you could people who say capitalism 
if you're not going to allow people to trade money freely and peacefully, then you're not really a capitalist. And anarcho-capitalism is it, it, redundant because it's, those two things are the same thing. And when people say libertarian, I think that the people who go into politics with the, and, and use the, the, the big L libertarian, I don't want to attack anybody, but at the very base, libertarian is uh, is anarcho-capitalism. I mean, it's, it's the idea that you uh, have free will and non-aggression, and that if you go out into a system of aggression, even I know they're trying to limit it in many cases, but even to me then, uh, libertarian, the, the actual real definition for libertarian is just free will, just like anarcho-capitalism or voluntarism or all that stuff. They all mean the same thing to me. Which, yeah, which is why you, you, I mean, maybe you and others use the word voluntarism. I'm, I'm not hostile to that term at all. I mean, I, I, I understand why you use it. I think there's something to that. I mean, it's about doing things voluntarily. It's about consensualism. It's about you should leave other people alone unless they volunteer or agree to it, right? It's you know, live and let live basically is the philosophy. Right. Hey, uh, Harrison has one more question for us. Sure. He says, uh, Mike, last thing. Could you put forth the question of is self just a mental state due to biological reasons and hence the reason to advocate for body ownership since the body is physical yet? I don't know if I understand that or can answer that, but l l let me give my take on it. I, I'm not a, I don't pretend to be a philosopher. Um, I, 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 I think that we have the ability as humans. We're fairly advanced, and we have concepts and intelligence and language, and we can communicate with each other. And I think you can use fairly common sense terms in conceptual ways. It seems to me clear that the concept of self is different than the concept of body. Ex accepting that sort of dualistic notion is not mystical necessarily. You can be religious or you can be non-religious and still hold this view. Um, just like Mises distinguished between behavior and action, right? Behavior is the actual motions of a body that you observe. Action is a choosing being acting with a purpose. Now. By reasonable inference and introspection and knowledge of ourselves, when we see another human body behaving, we impute to it action. We assume that it's acting. right? We assume it's not a robot, and I think it's a reasonable assumption. But there's a difference between action and behavior. There's a difference between body and person. There's a difference between mind and brain. For example, the brain weighs about three pounds, but the mind has no weight. A dead body has a brain but has no mind, for example. The, you don't have to be a mystic or a religious or supernatural person to believe in a conceptual distinction between these things. So to my mind, as a lawyer, as a legal-minded person, as a libertarian, the word self to me identifies your personhood, who you are as a, le a person with legal rights. Now, I don't believe that there's a soul floating out there and some ethereal object controlling your body like a puppet on a string. Some people might have that model. I don't care if they have that model. That's fine. I just think conceptually the concept of personhood is distinct from the body, but they're bound up together. They're also connected to each other. So I would say that uh, consciousness or the mind is – my view, personal view, is the mind is an epiphenomena of the activity of the brain. But that doesn't mean it does. It's not a real phenomenon that has a, a a legitimate or valid conceptual referent. The concept of mind has a referent. It's a description of the phenomenon that we do observe that exists in reality. I think it's thrown off by the brain, but that's fine, right? So I think personhood is more of a legal concept of identifying who you are um, as as a legal person, a person with legal rights. That kind of stuff. So the self right. to me is some kind of nebulous, vague concept of your identity as a person, which is associated with the given body. But the body is a corporeal, material, tangible, scarce resource that has a, a beginning and an end and changes over time. So I think there's a conceptual distinction, and you know, there's various philosophers probably have defined, and legal philosophers have defined. Uh, these terms more precisely, but it seems clear to me that there's a distinction between them, which is why I balk at the idea of self-ownership, um, although I use it myself, but more or less as a synonym for body ownership. 
I mean, you know, here's one thing I could argue too. What we don't know exactly if somebody dies, is there some minute weight? I'm talking point zero 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 one pounds that are lost or ounces or grams. You know that is there once you lose consciousness. Does some weight go away? You know, just to help solidify I, the difference between the two. Well, I, there's we don't know. We can't measure that. That's no, right no, now, pe people know? people have tried to measure that before. Actually, they, were just, they tried, but can they? Well, they've never they've never detected any difference. And and a lot of uh, say religious or supernatural people would say that the whole the whole project is misguided because the soul is not a corporeal thing. So. Then I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know what to right. It. But you, what you just reminded me of was uh, I just heard something recently. I forgot who it was. It was an older lecture where the um, the the speaker of uh, or maybe it's a clip from oh it's a clip from a movie. It's a clip from a movie where they talk about the weight of smoke. You ever heard about that? I ha I haven't heard of this. Like no. if you have a cigar, you smoke. Have what what a smoke weigh? Oh, okay, gotcha. And they said oh, you can never, you can't weigh smoke. It just goes up into the air. And the guy right. says, "No, here, here's how you do it. Take a cigar, you weigh it on a scale, then you smoke it carefully, and you tap all the ashes onto the scale. And when you're done smoking, you put the rest of it on there. And the difference is the weight of the smoke. Mm. You know, what it lost. And you could actually measure that because smoke does have some mass. Right, right. Unlike the soul. Unlike the, the alleged soul." <laughs> that's interesting. That's that's good stuff. So I'm gonna have to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Love to do today. it. Enjoyed it, Michael. You're great. Yes, sir. Yeah, had a great conversation. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Thanks. Hey, everyone, thank you guys so much for checking out Triple V. As you guys know, I have shows coming out every single day. <laughs> Sometimes two or three. Hopefully tonight, I'm gonna have a brand new video talking about the. It's a whole narration video series I got going talking about the unseen costs of the state. It's a very powerful narration video. So hopefully I can get it out by tonight. I'm, I'm planning on at least by six o'clock uh, tomorrow. I will be on Zeitgeist Radio, and they will be drilling me with questions on anarcho-capitalism. I'll try not to get caught in their trap of having them uh, basically say, well, this is only one way to do the, the non-aggression principle, right? So uh, we'll, we'll definitely have a good show on that tomorrow. And then, obviously, I have Daniel Rothschild on Friday, and then I shoot in the studio for the brand new internet TV show that we're starting up on Saturday, which will hopefully be released on Sunday. So very busy schedule for me. Uh, if you guys ever have a question about my schedule or you want to have somebody on my show, go over to voluntaryvirtues.com, click on the little calendar button, and you can always message me directly, and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Guys, thank you so much for checking out Triple V. As you guys know, I will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.